next is Wolfgang Tittel. Wolfgang is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Calgary, and AIT, AIT look, he's just distracted me, he's standing right beside me, just shows up here. They told me, by the way, I'm going to do your bio again, but they told me you could just jump off, and I was like, a brown man will not jump that high or that low, so it's not happening. <laughs> Wolfgang, on the other hand, is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Calgary and AITF Strategic Research Chair in Quantum Secured Communication. Ladies and gentlemen, Wolfgang Tittle. Thanks a lot, Jane, for this um, interesting introduction. We can start. <laughs> so we've heard a couple of different takes on the topic of transparency tonight. All interesting, all very different. And I will just take another, take again another take. Um, which is, I'm going to tell you that, as far as communications are concerned, we may not always want to have perfect transparency. We may not want everybody to know what we're talking about or what we're trying to communicate by mail. So, to start from the beginning, well, we're certainly all aware that the digital revolution has tremendously impacted our lives day to day. There's not a single day where we don't use email to communicate, where we don't use a web form to send some potentially sensitive information to some other people. And we have to make sure that only the good people get this information. The definition of good and bad is to everybody for himself um, here right now. And we have to make sure that whatever we communicate is not visible, is not visible, is not visible to people that we don't want to be aware of what we're trying to say. So we have to use something that we call encryption. We have to combine a message with some secret to make sure nobody can, can else, else can read it. And this is not new. This is thousands of years old. And here is a very simple example of encryption, where instead of sending the clear text, send more troops, um, well, we replace each letter by another letter, S by Z, E by U, and then we come to something that's called whatever. <laughs> turns out, even though this seems to be difficult to read, it's easy to break. And it suffices to know that if we talk about English, well, the most frequently used letter is E. So all we have to do is look at, well, which letter is, most, is used most often. That's an E. The second one is a T, and so on. It's actually very easy to figure out what has been encrypted. So that's not a good way to do it. How do we do it today? Well, if I would like you to be able to send me a message, I pick two prime numbers on the right-hand side here, I multiply those, and I send to all of you the result. You take this so-called public key, you combine it somehow with a message, and that is what you send to me. And it turns out it's only me who can decrypt it because I know the two prime numbers. Why is it secure? Or how is it secure? Well, it's secure as long as nobody else can factorize this very large number into its primes. But there's no guarantee for this to be actually difficult. There can be a better algorithm who can do it. There can be a better computer who can do it faster. And it turns out people know that the quantum computer, if we were able to build one, can do it in very, very short times. So we're getting into the realm of quantum theory right now, quantum physics, and I will not talk about computers, I will rather talk about how does quantum physics allow us to secure communications. And for that we just look at coins, and if these are classical coins, they can fall on heads and tails, if these are quantum coins, they can fall on heads and tails, but also on heads and tails at the same time. And that has very important consequences for copying. We know we can copy a sheep perfectly, but if the sheep would be a quantum sheep, well, the result looks somewhere the same. It has four legs. It looks incredibly cute, but it's not a sheep. <laughs> and it turns out we can use that to make sure that whatever key I send to somebody else, to Bob, well, we would see if some eavesdropper tries to steal what this key is. And it's simple. Well, Alice, the sender, uses photons, particles of light. Um, it codes key into those photons. And if an eavesdropper tries to copy, well, then these photons change. They look like those goats before. And the receiver can realize that. And if he realizes that, he wouldn't use the key, or if he realizes the key has not changed, he knows nobody has tried to copy it. And if we have a secret key, well, then I can just use this key combined in a very simple way the message, send the so-called cipher text, everybody can listen to it, nobody can make any sense out of it, only the legitimate receiver who has the same key can undo this calculation and come back to the original message. But there's a problem. We have to send particles of light from the sender to a receiver, and of course we would like the receiver to be far away. If it's very close, well, photons would always arrive. If it's 20, 20 kilo, 12 kilometers away, well, 50% of the photons gets lost. And if it's 100 kilometers away, then we lose pretty much everything. And to tell you how we can overcome this and make the transmission completely transparent, I have to introduce yet another fundamental property of quantum mechanics, which is entanglement. Suppose I have two coins. I flip the two very far away. These are quantum coins. They always fall on the same side, both heads, 
both tails, or both in the superposition of head and tails at the same time. <laughs> and this allows us right now to teleport a quantum key from here to potentially arbitrary far away. How does that work? Well, Alice on the left-hand side there, well, she has lots of photons, and all these photons represent zero and ones for keys. And Bob and Charlie managed to, to share entangled photons. Now, Alice sends Charlie her photons, and Charlie looks at how they collude with the photons he has. And he makes some measurements, and it turns out that the photons are Bob's, they somehow change their properties. They somehow take on the keys, the information about the key that Alice originally sent to Charlie. There is a trick about that, an important thing, which is if Charlie looks at those photons, he doesn't see any modification. He first has to await some information from, if Bob looks at those photons, he doesn't see any change. He first has to wait for information from Charlie that tells him, I've made these measurements, and that is what I've measured. And that allows Charlie, allows Bob, to make sure that his photons right now contain exactly the information that Alice originally encoded. So we have transmitted the key via teleportation from Alice to Bob. What of caution? This is not Star Trek teleportation. <laughs> it doesn't work faster than the speed of light, and it doesn't go anywhere in the universe. We have to establish something else, something first, where we would like the key to arrive. We have to send these photons. Well, we have done that a couple of months ago. We've been able to teleport quantum information keys across the city of Calgary, where Alice was located down there at Manchester, that's the neighborhood of Calgary. Um, Bob was at the University of Calgary, and Charlie was close to here at City Hall. And here is a picture, or you see a little bit of the instruments, looks a little bit like a mess, I would say. Um, <laughs> this picture is this green light, that's an intense laser, and where it glows, there is a particular crystal, and that is what creates these entangled photons, which then go to Bob and to Charlie, and the tell us to teleport. With this, I come to the end. What do I want you to take home? Maybe. Science is cool. <laughs> <laughs>